All right, what's up guys? I hope you're doing well. James here from jamesdforesight.com. As you can tell, I'm traveling for work again, so we're doing more of these types of videos as I'm gone. So I kind of wanted to transition a bit more over to the Carter glass bill and kind of going into how that was created in a way. Because before, I've already done uh, at least a few videos, to say the least, on the creation and kind of the history of the Aldrich Bill and kind of giving some kind of more specific, I'll say, historical sentiment with like um, news articles, letters, that sort of thing, kind of about that historical period. But now we're going to a few years into the future, more specifically between uh, Woodrow Wilson's um, election and inauguration so kind of the fall of 1912 going into 1913 and um, at this time you know since Wilson won and so basically the the concept of banking reform and all of the kind of the legislation for banking reform transition from being more of a Republican sort of thing um, with the Aldrich bill even though they were they wanted to keep politics out of it and try to have it bipartisan to where it's not really attached to a party um, it's it was still kind of attached to kind of big business Republicans so to speak of the time specifically because of Aldrich right and this is one of the things we've discussed before is basically he attached his name to it against the advice of some of the other people involved so it is what it is that attachment happened but basically going into the biggest differences for banking reform between the republican party and the democratic party at this time was basically that of control so in the aldrich bill the control of the we'll just say federal reserve system i know that's not technically what it is for the aldrich bill we've We've discussed that rather in depth about, you know, the uh, National Reserve Association and the differences there. Um, just to kind of, the new banking system is what we'll kind of describe it as. And so, basically, um, it was very privatized for Alder the Aldrich plan, right? But the Democrats did not want that at all. They wanted a lot more government control. And so we see that significantly in kind of how they dealt with this. And so I'll basically be using uh, the Federal Reserve System, its origin and growth, um, written by Paul M. Warburg, um, just to kind of use that as a, and, and look at this in his context, one, because it's in the public domain, two, because it's a primary source, and that sort of thing, because he, he advised um, so many people during this time. And he was approached by a lot of high-level Democrats in this respect during this time um, for advice on his on banking reform. So to continue on, um, some months before the election, he had been invited, he being Paul Warburg, um, to meet Colonel Edward M. House. And in the course of a year, he met Senator Owens and many other members of both houses of Congress. And I kind of want to accentuate accentuate the um the name colonel edward m house um, because from my understanding there seems to be quite a bit of conspiratorial talk about that um or at least it, what that's what it seems to be branded as right and the problem is i mean i'm not really going to go too far in depth in that respect because i haven't looked so far into him in general but it seems like um house is kind of touted as kind of the puppet master of the Wilson administration um, in a way. I kind of just want to throw that out there because that's something I've heard. Again, I don't have any like, I don't have enough historical knowledge with, about him specifically to really be convicted about any of that. I just, that's something that seems relevant to bring up. <laughs> but regardless, kind of just continuing on. And so going into a, another kind of major player at this time was a guy named by the name of Mr. Morgenthau who approached Paul Warburg about this kind of about the idea of banking reform um, he was also being I'm sorry Morgenthau was a prominent member or prominent uh, he played a prominent role in the Democratic election campaign for the Wilson administration right and basically he asked Warburg to basically provide him a plan 
with um, you know major principles and that sort of thing um, for banking reform that the basically the Democrats couldn't introduce into their platform and maybe kind of alter it in a way that kind of fit them more I'll say and basically Warburg gave him this plan on December 7th 1912 um, just to kind of put in a little bit of context and then this thing in general in terms of his plan it was very similar to the Aldrich bill in respect but mostly just kind of different in terms of control again so to quote in general the powers to be enjoyed by such an institution were about the same as those which had been given to the proposed national reserve association in the aldrich bill the plan provided however for a measure of strong government control with almost direct government ownership of the bank which would indirectly make the circulating notes issued by the bank obligation government obligations so the democratic doctrine would thus have been respected without a surrender of extreme demands Right, and so this is really kind of accentuating how the Democrats wanted more public control. It was more government control. And then a lot of this can be seen with respect to the actual kind of connections between each the regional reserve banks, it's, which is really what we're talking about. Um, so to continue on, so lacking any indication regarding the direction in which those now in control would move, all suggestions concerning the external structure of the new system were, of course, of very little value and were bound to remain so until more definite information was made public by the Democrats. And so basically this whole kind of power struggle in a way, uh, the, de the Democrats were rather secretive with it, but it's, and I, I made a little note saying Jekyll Island question mark, like that's not, like the Republicans didn't do anything like that, having quite literally a secret duck hunting mission in southern Georgia on an island like it's a bit <laughs> it's on par we'll, we'll leave it at there that's not really what the purpose of the video is to go into that specifically but really kind of want to what I wanted to go more into is coming into this next page right so in as much as it is out of the question to make one superman the yeah, one superman the financial dictator of the whole united states and as the democratic platform made it impossible to provide for the regional banks an organic connection such as that devised by the aldrich plan the creation of a board was in the end the only possible solution and so basically this became the board of governors right and it's something to keep in mind because when you have the major problem with power in this respect for each regional reserve bank is if you just have them be if they're just the top layer and there's no connection or kind of communication um, on kind of a internal level um, if they're not connected somehow on a I don't know if I'd say legal kind of route but regardless if they're not connected and they can't work together then they're competing with one another and that pretty much kind of destroys the what the whole purpose of this banking reform was right was to basically create some centralization of reserves because that was thought to be the major problem at the time right and why we had the panic of 1907 and the ones prior was basically bank reserves weren't able to flow to where they needed it needed to in the country to basically prevent runs or basically keep banks solvent right regardless of where they were and so basically the idea was to centralize these reserves in one entity which basically allowing them to go out throughout the country wherever they were needed and that's one of the things i have a few videos going much more in depth in i think each individual point right and so i'll kind of leave those off to the wind in that respect since it's been gone over so much but really the idea and one of the interesting points that I, I think is one of the interesting points for this kind of control structure, right, is you have these regional reserve banks and how they're connected. And so we know if there's no connection, basically they'll just compete each other and we didn't solve the problem and it kind of completely negates the reason for such banking reform. However, if we we still want them to be independent because there's needs for each 
the, the needs of the country in the in the whole aren't going to be the same throughout all throughout time all throughout whatever right they they need to be have some independence throughout um and they did originally because basically especially with the discount rates that each regional reserve bank could provide they could be different per region and basically the board of governors would just you know like i can't remember the word for it basically just say like okay you're good like you you can have that rate that's fine and and they could like veto it and that sort of thing too there's a bit of check and balances but it wasn't like dictatorial powers and then every single region has to have the same fed funds rate um obviously it wasn't fed funds at the time because each region was different but to make an analogous a modern analogy that would make sense right that kind of discount rate could change throughout the country depending on the banks and it didn't really happen until we started to revise the Federal Reserve Act to where that changed and we got the FOMC and that sort of thing right and so that's one of the things that I think is kind of interesting because that also branches into the conversation into the debate it seems seemingly a heating debate about um, the number of reserve banks right but we're gonna leave that to a completely separate topic because it's kind of going away from control more or less but let's see to kind of conclude um, Mr. Glass, um, Carter Glass, right, basically kind of obviously the, the f major footwork behind the Glass Bill, um, wrote a book called Adventure in Constructive Finance where he kind of goes over this. And there's a lot of discrepancies between his book and a lot of the other ones um, with respect to like the Aldridge Bill and this whole kind of creation of the Federal Reserve that I always thought was kind of interesting. So he originally planned that the only connecting link between the various regional banks should be the comptroller of the currency. And then Warburg goes on to say, those who know Mr. Glass's conservative temperament, however, will find it difficult to believe that he intended to give this one individual wide powers, which later on were vested in, were vested in the Federal Reserve Board. So he had also done, he had done so, um, I'm sorry, had he done so, he would have created an autocrat with greater powers than the American people have ever invested in a single person, right? And so basically, because I think he, there's another one to where technically, like if you want to go like very nuanced and very technical, the Federal Reserve Board, at least at this time, had, see, 127 powers and duties um, that he cites, that Warburg cites from something written by, we'll say, Mr. Charles S. Hamlin, right? And basically holding the entire Federal Reserve System together. So that's a lot of powers to invest in one person. Um, and especially like the control of the currency. And this is where we get into the whole idea of trying to quote the exact phrase that he used. Uh, the one Superman, the financial dictator of the whole U.S. that he said a few minutes ago, essentially what that would have done without having this be a board and so if you're going to connect such an fundamental entity for the, a country and any kind of nation uh, especially with the monetary system i mean if that collapses everything else is kind of just gone more or less <coughs> excuse me sorry um so if you, you have to invest that in some kind of like board to where there can be differing opinions, not to say there are, but to say there can be at least, or at least kind of the illusion of differing opinions, that's kind of up for debate. But regardless, um, it, it's important not to give that just to one person, right? And that kind of leads to the whole power argument in general um, that we're not gonna get into in this video in terms of like, in terms of power in with respect to a single person to where they really do kind of become more or less of a dictator now regardless if you think that's i'll say regardless if they're benevolent it, it really doesn't matter because that leads to the whole argument okay yeah this one's benevolent but what about the next one the whole power corrupts absolutely kind of phrasing and that sort of thing but we're not going to get not going to discuss that in depth i guess i'll say but that's pretty much it in terms of what I wanted to go over in terms of kind of the this 
battling between the power structure for the Aldridge bill and the glass bill, right? And kind of really going into how that applies to the Federal Reserve System and how they were going to structure, how the how the power and control would have been structured or was structured, right? And kind of the difference between the two, because that was one of the biggest problems that people didn't want a central banking organization or however you want to word it um, at the time was because of the fear that Wall Street would just take over because this was a much different type of Wall Street than we see today um, in the early 1900s, right? And so that kind of goes into a little bit about a little bit of what we've learned about from the book the house of morgan um and where he breaks up like you know the the diplom i'm sorry the the casino age from like the cas i'm sorry i completely flipped those around the baronial age from of banking from like the mid or early 1800s up until i think almost 1900 or so and then you kind of get into the diplomatic age with the world wars and that sort of thing to where it was more diplomatic and they were more on the scale of countries and that sort of thing. And then you get into more of the casino age of derivatives and that sort of thing in the kind of latter half of the 1900s. But kind of following the general narrative of banking and finance in general um, kind of fits right in there with the end of the baronial age going into the diplomatic age, right? Um, anyways, I'm going to leave this one here. So with that being said, I hope you guys have a good night and I will see you on the next one.